second part of our lesson that we started last week. Uh, we saw the struggle between the idea that it is a blessing of the Lord to make rich and he adds no sorrow to it. And we were asking when businesses uh, uh, inflate their profits and hide their losses uh, and still make a lot of money, is that scripture fulfilled in that situation? Uh, we looked at the fact that uh, businessmen in Israel, uh, who were the children of God, uh, had to live under tremendous amount of restrictions. Uh, they, they one of the Sabbath day, uh, where they were to do no work at all. We saw in Nehemiah how uh, easy it was uh, to just dismiss that uh, because of the competition and the fact that most of the heathens would have been working on the Sabbath day and just fall back into selling on the Sabbath day and trading <coughs> on the Sabbath day so that you don't lose any advantage. Uh, we, we saw how uh, the poor were not to be taken advantage of and the, the fields were not to be uh, reaped to the very corners <coughs> and the edges and the corners were to be left for the poor to come in and to glean and uh, even in the fruit harvest when they uh, knocked the fruit off the tree, whatever was left on the tree was to be left there. Uh, and they were to leave it for those who were poorer to come in and to be able to take the leftovers. So there was uh, many and varied restrictions like that which would have put the businessman at a disadvantage. But at the same time, it was a test for them as to whether they wanted to serve God or serve mammon. And if they kept the, the, all, all of these requirements, if their major uh, mindset was to please the Lord and to do what is right, uh, and then if the Lord was pleased to bless them in their business because of that, then everything was working the way it should work. Everything was working to the glory of God. So, um, so we, we saw that, and uh, the advice was that we are also, as Christians, we need to keep within the restrictions of the, the, the Word of God. We need not to let our business uh, take the place of our worship or uh, cause us in any way to lose our integrity as those who have Christ living in them. Christ is the living in us and that is our integrity and we need to make, maintain that in the face of all temptations and, and all difficulties that we present, that has to remain true and that has to, we have to remain firm in our resolve to keep it true in our lives. All right, uh, today I want to start off this lesson by telling you a story. There were five princes, young princes, in China who appeared before the emperor. Of these five, one is going to be a successor. It's hard to choose which one. So the emperor gives them a test. He gives each one a seed. And he asks them to go away and plant that seed and come back in a year so that he can see the result of that planting. So Prince Mao goes away and he plants the seed in a very special pot, and he waters it, and he puts it in a warm place, and he comes and he does what is necessary to feed it, uh, uh, it takes very special care of it, and he watches and watches, and nothing happens. His heart sinks down to his boots. The year is passing, and still nothing is happening. On the day that the princes were to return to the emperor, two of his friend, friends, who were princes, came to his house. <coughs> but they were carrying magnificent <coughs> specimens of foliage in their pocket. And uh, they asked Prince Mel where was his tree? And he says, nothing grew. So they suggested to him, well, why don't you just substitute another tree for the one that was supposed to grow and bring that along? And he said to them, 
I can't do it. I said, why? He says, because it's dishonest. Anyway, when they get there, all four of them have lovely specimens. They're all standing there before the emperor. And Prince Mel has a pot with nothing in it. So, of course, the emperor's attention is immediately contracted to him. And he says, have you got no growth to show me? And Prince Mel said, with his head bowed low and in a very humble voice, he says, I took the seed, I planted the seed, I watered the seed, I kept it in a warm place. I looked and I looked and I expected to grow and nothing grew. He says, that's very interesting. He says, the seed I gave you princes was a seed that couldn't grow. And he says, because of that, because of the courage and the honesty of Prince Mao, I appoint him my successor. I hope that teaches us a lesson. The courage to be honest, the courage to say what is truthful, the courage not to cheat, will be blessed by the Lord. And we need to understand it, Will, and we need to not lose our courage when we're presented with the temptation to do otherwise. Riches themselves present us with the temptation. As we know from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, <coughs> Says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction, he says. I'm going to read that again because I don't think we really believe this. He says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Now having said that, when young people are starting out in life, they develop an attitude towards life by what they see <coughs> and what they've experienced up to the point that they've lived. And in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 10 and verse 19, we see these <coughs> young princes, foolish, indolent young princes, who think they've got it all worked out. And their attitude to life is an attitude which I think is representative of the attitude of most young, inexperienced uh, people. It says there in verse 19, men prepare a meal for enjoyment and wine makes life merry and money is the answer to everything. And I'm going to take that last part, the first part is to deal with their enjoyment, but the money brings the enjoyment. So money being the answer to everything is the way they would view this. <coughs> What's your view? What was your view when you started out? Is it still your view as a Christian? We need to ask ourselves that question. <coughs> but while we're answering the question, we need to be reminded that Jesus himself taught us to be on our guard <coughs> against every form of breeze. Luke chapter 12. <coughs> the story
story here. There's a man who raises his voice from the ground and said to Jesus, verse 13, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. It is true, even in the present day, where there's a will, there's a relative. <laughs> and wills and the benefits that they bring have caused more trouble than anything else. And families are divided because of it, and families live in hatred of each other because of the outcome sometimes of the wills. But this man is being hard done by. He wants his brother to divide the family inheritance with him. Notice what Jesus said to him. When he said to him, Man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? <clears throat> then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. <clears throat> This man obviously felt he had a justifiable case and he wanted Jesus to be the arbiter. Jesus didn't want to have anything to do with these money matters. And he reminded not only him but everybody else as well that even though you might have a justifiable case in your own head, you've got to ask yourself, am I motivated by greed here? Is this the bottom line? Do I think my life will be more secure with that extra money? Do I think I'm going to be a better person because of him dividing out the family inheritance? Is my family going to be more secure? Is everybody going to be more happy with this newfound wealth? We think money is the answer to everything. I'm sure this man was thinking exactly the same. If I could get him to divide the family inheritance, our lives would be enriched and everything would be hunky-dory. Your life doesn't consist of your possessions. As a matter of fact, you could be stripped of everything that you own, even the shirt on your back, and you'd still have a life. You might say it's a miserable life. And maybe so, but it's a life. So life wasn't your possessions. It is you and what you're living and how you're thinking and who you are. That's what's important, not what you've got. He told the parable to them. He said, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build large ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for you many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now there's no mention of God in this. No mention of being willing to help his fellow man in this. All he saw was his enrichment his security for the future, everything was going to be great. He'd won the lotto, so to speak, in that day and time. Verse 20, God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You have a job that demands your every minute, your every waking minute, maybe even your every sleeping minute. <coughs> and you decide that this job is enriching me enough so that I can get what I want for my family, enough that will secure me for the future. And you allow this job to cause you to miss services, to miss worshiping God, to miss remembering the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the Sunday, to miss contributing to the Lord, to miss encouraging your fellow saints. You're doing all of this for money. Make no mistakes, bottom line. If you had a death in the family, would you have any problem approaching the boss and saying, I need to go to this funeral? 
someone in my family died, and if he says, you can't go, you have to work, he'd say, well, just too bad. I'm going, and you can fire me if you want, but I'm going, because you're being unreasonable, and your demands are too high. But when it comes to serving the Lord, <coughs> We will not even ask. We won't even try it and make make a, a deal with somebody else. I'm not saying this about everybody here, because I know there's people who have stood up and said, I have wanted to worship on Sunday, and was threatened mm -hmm. by their job. And finally, after we had written them a letter and that, they conceded and left the person work a deal with some of the other workers to take the Sunday shift <coughs> and that they would take another day or another time. So it can be done. What I'm saying to you is business is going to is insatiable. And these managers have got to get results and their jobs depend on it and they feel that they just can demand anything of anybody. We have a right in this country to worship and no job can take that away from us. We can challenge it. But maybe you wouldn't be up to the challenge. In Proverbs 28, 20 and 22. It says in verse 20, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who makes haste to be rich will not go unpunished. And then if you jump down to verse 22, he gives a further explanation of this. He says, a man with an evil eye hastens after wealth and does not know that want will come upon him. Now if I understand this correctly, what, what it is is uh, that there's a desire to be rich and that this is this is not to please God, this is to please self. This is a, a determination that has arisen out of the belief that money is the answer to everything. And it will be the answer to everything in my life as well. And it's evil because there is no consideration of God in this matter. It's evil because your soul is being robbed of the true life. It's evil because there's nobody else in this equation but you and yours. Not the poor, not the helpless, <clears throat> not those who are in need, the orphan or the widow. It is just me. <clears throat> so he says then, uh, a man with an evil eye hast hastens after wealth and does not know that want will come upon him. The very thing that we think is going to secure our future is the very thing that will disappoint us in the end. Frustrate us. And we will see the futility of it. You've got to remember, if you need to be reminded, just go to the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon experimented with life and, and looked for answers to life uh, from life under the sun. Now every now and then he, he does bring God into it, but he's looking at it from <clears throat> the, the standpoint of the human. It's down on our level. And he says, look, I enriched myself above anybody before me. I had parks, I had slaves, I had wives and concubines, I had money and riches, I had everything. And what's the conclusion of it? All is vanity, futility, <coughs> emptiness. Why? Because even if he held on to it until he died, who's going to inherit it? And what are they going to do with it? What if the son is foolish, or the daughter is foolish and squanders it? All that hard work gone for naught. That's how futile it can all be. So it really just uh, requires you 
to, to understand that your life is your life. It is not your job. Your job is not your life. You've got a life that is greater than your job. You've got a family. You've got brethren. You've got God. There is much more to life than just business. But there's something obsessional about business, and especially in this day and age, that makes, that sucks you in to the extent that there is nothing else. Everything else is just periphery stuff. But Christianity has to be at the core of our heart and of our, of our life. God has to be there. And that, and that in Jesus Christ our Lord. And only when that's there can we deal with business as a periphery, just as we deal with family and, and neighbours and, um, and the events that are happening in life and all the other things. When the core is right, everything else will find its proper place. The Holy Spirit uh, warns us about desiring these riches and making it our lifelong ambition and our lifelong struggle. First Timothy chapter 6, back, back there again. First Timothy 6, verses 9 to 11. It says, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This has to do with hidden distress, pain of mind and of body. He says, but flee these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. That's our job. That's <clears throat> our job. We need money. There, nobody's questioning that. We need money to pay the bills. We need money to live. We need money. But money is not God, nor should we make it our God. Nor should we desire it to the extent that we are ready to sacrifice everything in order to get it. We need to be reasonable and understand that there is grave dangers in the love of money. They say money is the root of all evil. They're misquoting this passage of scripture. It's the love of it. It's your attachment to it. It's your desire for it. It's your, it's your being enamored with it feeling that it gives you something which only God can give you. We'll talk a bit more about that next week when we talk about the pride aspect that uh, uh, money engenders. But uh, we're, we're not to, uh, to seek it in this way. It is, it is just dangerous. Uh, Proverbs 23, 4 and 5 tells us not to weary ourselves in that pursuit. <laughs> Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes for itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. If you are seeking righteousness, and all that goes with it, seeking to please the Lord, seeking to be Christ-like, and to allow Christ to be you, he says, all these other things will be added to you. You, you, you don't have the burden of carrying uh, that weight on your mind and on your shoulders which says, I've got to make myself rich. I've got to be in control here. I've got to have that power. I've got to have that uh, status. I, I've got to have that amount. Uh, you, you're putting pressures on yourself which for most of us are hard to bear. You've just got to calm yourself down 
I can't serve God and mammon. If my serving mammon means all my mind and all my life, then you are serving God, you're serving mammon as your God. You can be religious, but not be serving God. You can be uh, religious as an adjunct to your desire for riches. But you can't be trying to serve God, really serve God, and be trying to serve riches at the same time. It just doesn't work. They're not on an equal footing. They never were, they never can be. God must be the center of it all. And in that pursuit of serving God and righteousness, then if God sees to bless you in your business, in your uh, career, uh, in your daily work, then isn't that a great blessing indeed? But it will only be if you put your mind on God and allow Him to do the blessing and not to take it into your hands to bless yourself. The truth of the matter is we can't serve God and, uh, and man uh, our riches. Matthew 6, 24. Uh, I'll just say this about it. Uh, one attachment will always be stronger than the other. So you have straight away, which attachment is stronger in your life? Is it money? Or is it spirituality? God. Which one is, which one is the stronger? Be honest with yourself. Which one is the stronger? Even if it is money, just say so to yourself. And say so to God because he knows already. But you have to say then, is that right? And the answer to that is no, it's not right. My attachment is to God and I will use money to lay up treasures for myself in heaven. I will use money to glorify God and to benefit my fellow man. That's what the money is there for. That's the way we should approach it. <coughs> We should be willing, if necessary, like the rich man, young ruler, to give up everything that we own to follow Jesus Christ. Now that's, I know it's radical, that's very radical, but there's a sense in which you're doing that in the small ways. You're doing it by coming to services when they want you to work. You're doing it by being generous and helping other people who need help. You're doing that in the way you contribute to the Lord. You're doing that in your attitude towards God and towards riches. You know that God is completely and absolutely the only one I can trust. And these riches, they may bring some comforts and some security, but it's an illusion. It's an illusion. I know that, uh, that wealth is spoken of as a strong city in the eyes of, uh, like, a, like a, a high wall in the imagination of those who are rich. That's the way, it comes, that's what it comes down to. I've got a, a strong fortress to, in which I can defend myself against anything, riches. <laughs> but the Christian says, I've got a strong fortress that I can run into when there's any danger. Who can protect me from everything? God. There's the difference. There's the difference. In Luke chapter 12, 32 to 34. <coughs> <coughs> He talked about worrying about what you will eat or what you're going to put onto your body. He says, Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And most people say, Well, that, that statement is for the birds anyway, for sure, because 
I'm worried about how I'm going to manage. And I'm not going to stop worrying about how I'm going to manage. And I don't care what God says about feeding me. I don't have enough faith in him in order to do that. I'd rather have the money in the bank and know that I was secure. Well, even now, you even just saying have money in the bank, you know that it's not secure there anymore. You know that. If the banks collapse, everything's gone. Everything we thought we had, our own, it's all gone. So, look, put the trust in God and start putting it in the world. The lilies of the field, they're beautiful, um, but uh, <coughs> they're only temporary. And yet God looks after them. So he says, look, verse 29, do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. Stop the worrying. Say to the Lord, look, Lord, I know that I'm facing a crisis or a difficulty financially and so forth, but I trust you. You can look after me. If Jesus could multiply the loaves and the fishes to feed 5,000 and it was nothing to him, what's the barrier in the way of him feeding you? Why all this great crisis? Why all this worry? He goes on to say now, uh, in verse 30, for all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and here's the test. Seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near, no moth destroys, but where your treasure is, or for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There is no doubt. Your heart is where your treasure is. If your heart's with God, your treasure is in God. If your heart's with the money and the material possessions and the good life, then your heart is not with God. You can say it is. You can say you're religious, you can say all you like, but your whole attitude towards the thing proves what it was. You know, we we'll talk about them desiring these riches, and what we should actually be desiring, and it's good to take that into the heart. But then, see, young people look at uh, people who are rich, and they see their lives, you know, very comfortable, easy, plenty to spend, can go where they like, <coughs> make decisions about things, get what they want. Uh, everything <coughs> just seems to be the way you would want it in a fleshly sense. Luxury homes, cars, holidays, smart friends, uh, everything uh, is going for them. And it's easy to look and to be tempted, even for the mature Christian. As we know from Psalm 73, uh, he looked and he nearly fell. He, ne he nearly gave in to the temptation because of what he saw. He saw himself struggling and he saw these rich people having the life of riding and everything going well for them, that cattle breathed uh, the, when they had the uh, calves and so forth. There was never a miscarriage. Everything just seemed to go fall into place for them. And here you are struggling with the pennies and worried about your children and grandchildren and so forth. And, and you say, well, what's the point in all of this? Let's join the rest of them. Let's try and be like them. Even Job was, um, was willing to say what it looked like from his standpoint with regard to the rich. Uh, Job chapter 21, beginning with verse 7. Of course, he was answering his friends who were saying, well, if you're wicked, uh, things are not going to go good for you and uh, everything um, is going to fall apart on you. Job says, that's not what I observe in life. 
That's not what I observe. He says in verse 7, Why do the wicked still live and continue on also become very powerful? If your argument is right, this wouldn't happen. Their descendants are established with them in their sight, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God on them. His ox, ox mates without fail, his cow calves and does not abhor. They send forth their little ones like the flock, and their children skip about. They sing to the tremble and harp, great life, rejoice at the sound of the flute. They spend their days in prosperity, suddenly they go down to the shoal. Of course, there is death that comes in every now and then. And they say to God, depart from us, we do not even desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve? And what would be gain if we entreat him? See the arrogance? See the pride? I've got what I want. I don't need God. I've got all this around me. And a bank account. I don't need anybody. I don't need anything. I don't need God. I don't need anything. I'm just self-sufficient. Self-contained. people look at this who are struggling or considered on the bottom of the ladder and their desire is I want to be like that I want to be like that why can't my life be like that so it is a big law and it's a big lie now if you <coughs> you want it you have to start somewhere trying to get it and of course, uh, it starts off, <coughs> that person starts off from the course of manipulating situations and people for the sake of gain. Let's look at uh, two scriptures, Proverbs chapter 20, 14 and 17. <coughs> somebody else is trying to sell to No offense to anybody, who wants me to second hand car salesman. <laughs> you bring your car in, boy, all the faults he finds with is unbelievable. He convinces you that it's worth less than you want it for. But the only reason he's doing it is not because the car is that bad at all. They even made allowances for all the faults when they, when they market the prices for a car. Uh, uh, it's because I want to make more profit. I want that money to be in my pocket, not his pocket. Bad, bad, says the lawyer. And how often that is, that is the way it is. Just a simple little thing. Undermine a person's confidence in what they're selling and you can get it for less than it's worth. It's just manipulation. Small, small matter. But done enough times can enrich you. It can get you money which you wouldn't otherwise have had. A bank account that will please you. But look at verse 17, what it says there. Bread obtained by falsehood is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be filled with wrath. Quite, quite a, a pictorial thing. You, you eat the bread, and, and because it, it's uh, being gained by lies and subterfuge and crooked dealings, you, it's so sweet. It's like when you ate those crab apples from after you boxed the orchard or you robbed the orchard, and and everybody's all the gang is standing around. And it's like nectar. You're eating the stupid things, and you don't realize later on you're going to have such cramps in your tummy. Uh, it's just not funny. But because everybody's on a high, we've done something and got away with something we shouldn't have done. Everybody thinks they're they're like red apples, ripe as could be. But 
that causes the problem. And the gravel in the mouth is the cramps in the tummy. <coughs> We mentioned already last week using false weights and measures. If you can uh, make them believe that your measure is the standard measure, <coughs> you can, by have, having shortened that measure, gain a few yards or a few feet or a few centimeters. And the more you do that, the more customers you do that with, they'll by, by the time you finish maybe the week, you'll have saved a whole roll of material. Another roll that you can sell, another roll that can enrich you. There was no standards of weights and measures back then. It was up to the individual to be honest. So if you had a set of weights for your potatoes or whatever else you were selling that were under the standards, and you pull them out like you're an honest man to put them on the scales. They're getting less of the product, paying more for it, and it's all going into your pocket. God had, a, had a, an observation on this uh, in Micah chapter 6 verse 11. And I think it's one that we all should read and take it hard. Mike is one of those small books near the end of the Old Testament. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Micah chapter 6, verse 11. Verse 10 here. Is there yet a man in the wicked house along with treasures of wickedness and a short measure that is cursed? Can I justify wicked scales and a bag of deceptive weights? For the rich men of the city are full of violence, her residents speak lies, their tongues is deceitful in their mouth. So also I will make you sick, striking you down, desolating you because of your sins. I say. It's, it's a small matter, I mean, in terms of, uh, of, of selling, it's just small amounts. But most supermarkets and pound shops know that, uh, that if you only have a small markup and you're selling great quantities, you can make a lot of money. You can make a lot of money. That was the principle. If I can short change there, and if I do that with lots of people, that short change becomes a large amount of money, and it's a minor. So the differing weights and the different measures were a great temptation in, in back in that day and time. And obviously, a lot of people fell for it in order to enrich themselves. But for the most part, they were, they were taking it off the poor people who didn't have the money in the first place. They had no social conscience. It didn't matter that the poor became poor. Nothing. That doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter today. With rich nations, it doesn't matter that there are poor nations. Well, just too bad. We'll send over some aid. If the crooks don't get it, then maybe a few people will get it. And, uh, and then our conscience is, is solved. There's nothing. We're, we're doing the best we can for them. But why cheat them in the first place? Why put restraints on them, like you have to have free trade, and then we put tariffs to save our, on, on, on our stuff to save ours from being decimated by the free trade? There's all sorts of things going on to where uh, people showing that their heart is not in uh, helping <coughs> those who are poor, their heart is in taking advantage of them. And, uh, and that for, for selfish reasons. The withholding for it uh, was, was very strong as well. We, we mentioned last week in uh, Proverbs 11, 26, they were withholding the brain. And that was to increase our price. People were starving. And this is going to happen more with foodstuffs. I don't know whether you know it or not, but the speculators have got in, got in on food now. So they buy harvests 
huge harvest, the wheat harvest, and then they sell it to the highest bidder. And then he sells it back in order to make a bigger price on it again. So food, because it's now controlled by the speculators, will be a commodity that will become scarce at times. Because like the oil speculators, they want to make more money all the time. And it doesn't matter that you're paying through the nose for your petrol at the pumps. They don't care. What if we can't afford it? Get it. It's just too bad. That's the price. Why? For somebody up there who's got billions, billions, but he wants more. He's greedy. He wants more. And you're suffering. Wait till it's the food crisis. Wait till you see your children or grandchildren hungry. And then let's say how great these men are, these speculators. Let's see how, how your heart will go out to them in love and consideration when they don't consider you or your family or anybody else except their own bank account. People are foolish to destroy the ordinary peasant to enrich themselves because when the balance becomes great enough or the imbalance becomes great enough, there will be a revolution. People will just rise up and say, enough is enough, and they'll take everything from the rich. It happened in France. The king got the head chopped off, all the princes, everybody with money was taken to task and it was divided out. So why not be sensible and allow a little bit to flow back to the people who need it in order that you don't set up a situation where everything you have is going to be taken away from you. But they withheld, they not only withheld uh, the wheat, they withheld wages as well. Even in the book of James, he says this. Look at James chapter 5. It was still happening in the New Testament. <laughs> James doesn't look on it with favor at all. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth eaten. Your gold and your silver has rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh, flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cry out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist. Here's the kingpin. Why does he do all these things? Because he has the power to do it. We can't resist it, I assume. We. If we've got power over other people, we can't resist exercising that power over them. And even if it's to their hurt, we will do it. They got paid by the day back then, not by the week or by the month, by the day. That's how poor they were. If a man didn't get the wages that he had worked for that day, he would go home and his family would be hungry. They would have nothing to eat that day. What would it be like to be a laborer in the fields, broken your back all day in the heat, and come along and uh, the master decides he's not going to pay you today, even though you've done the work? And he sends you home to your wife and your son and children. Heartless? Absolutely. Absolutely. But withholding the wages may have gained your man a few, a few pounds with the bankers. And then when the harvest came and it was all in, and he had all this stored up in his in his granaries and where, wherever he was storing it, or, or his winery or whatever, then don't pay the people who've done the work. Now, how, how are they going? What are they going to do? Take them? Take him to court? He is the he is the richest. He had no chance. He bribes the judge. 
who's an alcoholic anyway, gives him a, an extra portion of the wine that he has in storage. And do you think justice is meted out for the poor man? Even in the courts, he is sent away because the judge has taken a bribe and the judge is in favour of the wicked rich man. That's how things go in this world. That's the climate that dishonest business and the desire for money creates. That's what we have to be a part of if we're going to have to live. At least that's the lie that's propagated. They didn't just withhold us, <coughs> they withhold pledges, pledges. It, it was possible, according to the law, for a man to uh, give a, a, a pledge or, and usually gave his outer garment for the rich man to hold so that uh, at the end of the day, when the money's paid out, he pay back the rich man that he borrowed from. <laughs> Uh, but there was a certain uh, call to it. The rich man couldn't go into his house. The poor man had to bring it out. The, what, God wanted to maintain the dignity of that poor person. Because most of those poor persons were religious. God fearing the people. And he wanted to see to their needs. But what had happened was the business had, uh, the business people had become so powerful that they were dead. And they wouldn't even bother to think of the needs of that person to cover himself that night with his outer garment. It was his blanket as well as his day wear. It was what he slept in to keep him warm. Let's have a look just here at Amos chapter 2 verse 8. Verse 6, he says, Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke its punishment, because they sell the righteous for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. Now, I don't know whether that was the injustices in the law courts or whether they were actually selling them on the open market as slaves uh, and uh, caught so little of them that a pair of sandals would do just to get rid of them and so they didn't have to be bothered with them again. But whatever way it was, God saw it as a transgression. Uh, these who pant after the very dust of the earth on the heads of the helpless also turn aside the way of the homeless. And a man and his father resort to the same girl in order to proclaim our holy name. This was when they went up to these um, Bible temples. Uh, and of course the rich were uh, able to get what they want. The sons were in on it. On garments taken as pledges, they stretch out beside every altar, and in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. They were fining people because they were paying late, and they were taking the fines, uh, imposing the fines on them, making further hardship for them, even though the, they would be promised that they'd get the money and the money would come in. But still, the fines were there, and they were using those fines. They would take wine or whatever, and they were uh, making themselves melody with drink while they were up with the with the girls up in the up, up there on the hill uh, and having a great time together. And it was it was that sort of thing that was going on. They withheld the tithes, the sacrifices from God even, so that the priests couldn't eat. But they were they were living in luxury all of the time. You see, coveting becomes a way of life. It just, you want it, you think about it, you've got to have it. And it doesn't matter who you work to get it. There's, uh, in the book of Micah, it's after Amos, Old Iron, John, and Micah. In the book of Micah, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, we can see this. This whole business going on. He says, Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is in the power of their hands. They covet fields and then seize them, and houses and take them away. They rob a man and his house 
a man and his, inter his inheritance. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am cleansing against this family of calamities, for which you cannot remove your necks, and you will not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time, he says. Now, all of, all of this was happening. Um, it, it created a crime, uh, climate of intimidation and fear, and it was the people who had the money that could get on under these circumstances. Um, they, they, there's all of that atmosphere in, in Amos 5, Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah 59, all describe the whole atmosphere that was created by this. And why all of this atmosphere? Why did it all happen? Well, I think Amos um, chapter 6, verses 4 to 8, and uh, I'm coming to the end, so just hang in with me just now. Uh, back to Amos. Verse 4, those who recline on beds of ivory, this is inlaid ivory, and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who impoverish to the sound of the harp and like David have composed songs for themselves, who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils, yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles, and the sprawler's banqueting will pass away, he says. Go back to chapter 3, verse 6 to 8. Amos chapter 3, verse 6 to 8. <coughs> The, I think the point of what he made is it made anyway. It, it was to support, it was to underpin a life of, of wanton luxury <clears throat> that all of these people were suffering and all of these people were tormented and all of these people were in pain. And these people were righteous, but they wouldn't oppose the rich because it was futile to oppose them. And when they did oppose them, they, they, were, they, they lost their case, and they lost their jobs, and they were isolated, and couldn't make money uh, to live. And, and that was the whole situation. And God saw it, and he was sick to his heart with it. And he decided, if the people on the bottom will not rise up, I will <coughs> send this whole nation away into exile because of the sins that are going on. Uh, anything that's obtained by fraud, doing this. It's going to be real. And at the end of it, as we know from James chapter 5, on the day of judgment, every wrong deed that you've done, every lie that you've told, everything that has been done uh, to defraud others will be held against you. Unless you see you've done it, acknowledge you've done it, say you're sorry for doing it, and stop doing it and start to do what is right, you're in trouble. Big trouble. Big trouble. Because then all the riches which you thought was your protection, your shield, your, your strong city, your high wall, it's all stripped away and everything is naked and laid bare to the eyes of God, the angels of heaven, and all who have ever lived from the beginning to the end. And all of it will witness against you that you lived your life selfishly to indulge yourself, to be rich, to care less about other people, to have no social conscience, to not feel anything but for anybody only for yourself. In Matthew chapter 19, 23 and 24, last question. said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. No. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples
Jesus heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And that's just the truth. So when you're chasing the riches, you are chasing your own life. You are putting yourself in a position where you could you could destroy your spirituality. You need to be aware of where it's leading you and the dangers and the pitfalls involved in it. You need to turn away from desiring it greatly. You need to put God in the center of your life. And if you are rich, and we'll talk again about that, you need to use your riches for God and for the benefit of your fellow man and lay up treasures for yourself in heaven in a way that few could do so. <coughs> Thank you very much, Very good. Excuse me.